Well, we're in the 21st chapter of the book of Luke. It's going to be the background of what most people call the Olivet Discourse. But we're going to present a view that you may find a surprise. Not free of controversy, but we'll give you the whole background. It has to do with the future of the na nation Israel, both in the near term and in terms of the gospel, but also further, and the destruction of the temple and so forth. So, chapter 20, where we just came from, that's where Jesus is adversaries questioned him and turned the ta he turned the tables on them by asking them questions. Well, in chapter 21, it's the disciples' turn to ask some questions, and they do that. We get into chapter 21, the first couple of verses. <clears throat> and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he, he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Now, it's actually, the word is lepta, it's, each one's about a fifth of a cent, at least by some reckoning. It's a very small amount of money, obviously. I want you to notice, though, however small it was, what people miss is she put both of them. That's all she had. They were small. She kept one and certainly acquitted herself by giving half of all she had. No, she gave both of them all she had in there. And Jesus said... Uh, of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have given of their abundance, cast in the offerings of God, and but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Wow. Aren't we in the same category as those Pharisees and so forth? We give out of our abundance indeed. She went far more than that. And she uh, obviously caught God's notice as in that regard. And uh, she gave more than all the others. God sees more than the portion. He sees the proportion. See, I don't think any of us are, uh, have gone to the extent of giving all that we have. Um, and uh, men see what is given, but God sees what is left. And uh, so I think that's, uh, we go on and on about that. Uh, Paul, in, sec in the second Corinthian letter in chapter 8, deals with much of this. But let's us keep moving here. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, Jesus said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Right here, it's clear he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple that occurred some 38 years later, 70 A.D., when it comes down. And he'd already told him that the city would be destroyed back in chapter 19. And he drew his reference from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. We talked about that then. Now, there are parallel accounts here. We're looking at Luke 21. Most people categorize this in accordance with Matthew 24, and Mark 13. In Matthew 24 and 25, clearly we have a discourse that was on the Mount of Olives, and we'll look at that here shortly because it'll be important background. But I want you to notice we're going to see this as a little different. Matthew gives us the most complete account, and he knew shorthand, so we think he, he took much of it down verbatim. Mark highlights the same material. It's really Peter's gospel, but uh, he highlights what he learned from the four that were present at the Galvet Discourse, namely Peter, James, John, and Peter's brother Andrew, those four. It was an insider's briefing to those four. And uh, so Matthew's account and, and Mark's account are focused on that, of course. And they receive what really was a confidential briefing because they came to Jesus privately at night, is the whole point of the Olivet Discourse. It's commonly assumed by many scholars and many of the helps that you may encounter Bibles, handbooks, and other things, that Luke 21 is the same discourse. But we're going to try to show you that it was very similar, but distinctive in some very important aspects. And I'll, we want to, suggesting we should uh, study this more carefully. I'm going to suggest to you, and I'll show you why, that what Luke records is not the Olivet Discourse. A discourse very similar in content, it's going to, it, uh, there's a danger, you see, when we harmonize parallel accounts. We see two or three accounts that seem very similar. We sometimes try to put them together to really glean all that we can. But these are two accounts that are similar, but they're distinctively different. They were a different occasion, a different audience, 
and a different focus. I'm going to suggest, I want you to test this in your own study. And I suggest that we need to distinguish between the account in Luke 21 and the accounts that are in Mark and Matthew, known as the Olivet Discourse. Let's do this by looking at the Olivet Discourse first. In Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Essentially, there's a one verse difference, really, and we'll just get into this. We'll t take a quick skim through this to refresh our memory. In Matthew 24, verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That obviously is very similar to the Luke account. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came, and we're going to discover the Luke account is not at night or on the Mount of Olives. It's in the temple during the day, but we'll get to that at the end. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Boy, those are some good questions. We obviously, he gets our attention immediately. The disciples came to him privately is a very key point here. And in the Mark account, which is very similar, as he went out of the temple, his disciples said unto him, Master, what manner of built stones and buildings? He says, same thing, not one stone left of another. But then you get to verse um, 3 of that uh, of the, of the Mark account, he says something interesting here. He gives us the names of the attendees. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives over and against the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. So we know there's four. Those four, they're listed by, by Peter, in effect, because Mark is his amanuensis. And the uh, same situation. They're very similar, except for another verse I'll show you shortly. He had his followers, but there's a group within those followers. That's the general public. There are the 70 that we uh, f find out about. Um, uh, in the para where he gave public parables uh, only after Matthew chapter 12. The 70 were pr privileged. Inside that we have the 12. Inside the 12 we have his inner circle of three guys, Peter, James, and John. And these were the ones that were close to, were allowed to go into Jairus' daughter, her raising. He, they were the three that were present at the Transfiguration. Those are the three that were closer in in the special circle at Gethsemane. And of course there are three of the four that were at the uh, Olivet Discourse. So we recognize there is a inner circle aspect to what we're talking about here. And getting back to the Matthew account, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. It's interesting, Jesus, in all of his accounts, both at the beginning and at the end, warns us not to be deceived. That's a command, not a suggestion, okay? He says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I want you to notice something. The things that we're going to list here are non-signs. I see many books on prophecy written about these signs of the times. Jesus designates these as coming, but they're not signs, because the end is not yet. Notice the distinction he's making. We're going to make more of that in a minute. So all these things shall come to pass, but the end is not yet. And here are the signs he's mentioning. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. Matthew clusters these and gives them a label. We're going to use Matthew's label as we go forward here of these particular things that are not signs. They're preliminaries, but not signs, okay? And so these, and we find these beginning of sorrows, these things, listed in Matthew, in Luke, and in the book of Revelation. False Christs are listed. The wars, the famines, pestilence, earthquakes flow in the sat order in Matthew. We'll see them later in the Luke account. And if you read Revelation chapter 6 from verses 1 through 12, you find the same pattern lined up with the horsemen and so forth. So these are a cluster of things that seem to go together. Jesus continues, When they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. So this colors the flavor of what he is warning them not to be deceived about. He's continuing here. But notice there's a very important word in verse 9. He's just talked about the beginning of sorrows, that cluster of things. Then shall they, and all this. He's now going to focus here in this account on that which will follow the beginning of sorrows. We're going to discover that Luke does the opposite. That's why I'm making a point of this here. 
because all that follows here happens after the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And that's agape, by the way. The word agape is there. My wife makes a point of that in some of her publications. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. For, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And then we get to the pivotal verse in the gospel, in the Matthew account, verse 15. It's the 14th verse in the in Mark account, but here's the key verse in many respects. In Matthew account, it says, Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let whoso readeth, let him understand. And here's where I like to pause and ask, how many of you have just read that with me? Can I see you a show of hands? I did a dirty trick. Because I've just obligated you to understand it. See, so you notice this parenthetical comment here. Whoso readeth, that's you now, let him understand. You now have a command. This is a highly technical thing, not easy. It's not obvious. But you now have a commitment to understand this, so you want to pursue it to the end. We won't get into it all tonight, but I'm going to expect you to be good, to do what Jesus said here. The abomination of desolation, that's a technical term. We know a lot about it because it happened three centuries before Jesus uses it as an idiom here. Abomination refers to idol worship. The abomination of desolation is the ultimate extreme of that, and that's an idol put in the holiest place on the planet Earth, namely in Jerusalem, in the temple, in fact, in the Holy of Holies. We know that from history, and so it's apparently going to happen again in the future. And he, he in fact, does something else here. He authenticates Daniel for you. Daniel the prophet. He's pointing them, incidentally, to Daniel chapter 9, which is a chapter that you want to learn. He's, he's highlighting that chapter as the key to understanding end time prophecy. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So you know who wrote Daniel. Jesus told you right here. And, st and this, is, this is an event that occurs in the Holy of Holies. There's a lot of other conjectures by various people that are not correct. This is precise. It's highly technical, but it's well specified. Trust me, get into it when you can. Stand in the holy place. Okay. And there's the command. You need to understand this. We won't do it all here. But that's what Matthew is, or should I say Jesus in the Matthew account, is focusing on. Now a little background. Antiochus IV, son of Antiochus the Great, as he's called, became the successor to his brother Seleucus IV, who had been murdered by his minister Heliodorus, uh, the king of Syria, uh, back in the, to the big event occurs in 164 B.C. He, uh, he, Antiochus IV was a despot. He was very eccentric, very unreliable, cruel, and obviously tyrannical. He adopted the term Epiphanes, which is an abbreviation, if you will, in the Greek, Theos Epiphanes, a designation he gave himself, the God who appears or reveals himself. That's a very, very humble title he took on for himself. Um, the kids in the street called him Epimenes, which means the madman. He changed that just a little bit and... Uh, Make, make, a, make a parody of it. But moving on. Antiochus undertook the total eradication of the Jewish religion. And uh, he was trying to establish the Greek polytheism in place of Judaism. And he did that by force. The observation of all Jewish laws, especially those relating to the Sabbath and to circumcision, were forbidden under pain of death. You were, as a parent, suddenly had a problem. Do you obey the law? You did it under risk of death. So very, very difficult times. All Jewish practices were set aside in all cities of Judea. Sacrifices had to be brought to pagan deities. You can imagine how that went over. And uh, the representatives of, crown, of the crown, that is of Antiochus, were everywhere enforcing this by, by police methods. Once a month a search was instituted, and whoever had secreted a copy of the law had, or had observed a rite of circumcision was condemned to death. Think of that, especially as a parent, your dilemma that you're facing there. In Jerusalem on the 15th of Kislev in December 168 B.C., which happens to be his birthday, I forget whether we point that out or not, he broke a league that he had made. It's interesting from a prophecy point of view, he made a commitment that he violated his own commitment. That's going to be a pattern also that's reproduced in the end in the time time. A pagan altar was built upon the great altar for an offering in the temple. He stripped the temple of all his treasures, of course, pillaged the city of Jerusalem, took 10,000 captives, compelled them to forsake worship. He forbid circumcision, violated the, uh, uh, crucif uh, crucified the violators. The Torah was forbidden and destroyed. All this isn't Josephus, by the way. It's well documented if you want to get into it. 
On the 25th of Kislev, that's right, that was his birthday, sacrifice was brought on this altar for the first time. They offered a swine in every village. They erected an idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And that's the biggie. That was the abomination of desolation. And it's called a desolating sacrilege in the book of Maccabees, the first book of Maccabees. And uh, it was uh, it considered that it's made at the temple to the Jupiter Olympus and so on. That led to a revolt, a very spontaneous revolt, would turn into a full-scale war. The, when the arrival of the officers came to carry out Antiochus, the decrees of the village of Medellin, there an aged priest named Matthias lived with his five sons. He becomes very, very famous. When Matthias killed both the first Jew who, reproached, who approached the pagan altar to offer sacrifice, and he killed the royal officer that was presiding, he and his sons fled to the hills, obviously. This was just not just an outburst tactic. It escalates to become a cause celeb for the whole country, and they actually succeed in throwing off the yoke of the Greek Empire. Matthias and his five sons became the nucleus of a growing band of rebels against Antiochus. He has five sons. They all had nicknames, but Judas Maccabeus was, Judas was called Maccabeus, which means the hammer, and that becomes the label for the whole gang, if you will, the Maccabean revolt, they call it because Judas was really the, the leader here. Matthias died soon after, leaving his leadership in the hands of Judas, whose surname Maccabeus became the source of popular name and so forth. He was a brilliant leader. And what had begun as a guerrilla war turned into a full-scale military engagement in which the smaller Jewish forces managed to defeat the much more powerful Syrian armies. Judas' most notable achievements, the, the recapture of Jerusalem, except for one part of it, the rededication of the temple after the defiled altar had been demolished and rebuilt, that rededication is celebrated to this day in what they call Hanukkah. And that's mentioned in the New Testament, by the way, in John 10, verse 22. It makes allusion to this, by the way. The rededication of 25th of Kislev was celebrated as Hanukkah. Antiochus' death also took place in 164. And uh, praise God for that. <laughs> and Judas continued successfully to press what is now, was now a war for independence. They achieved that and ushers in a period of history called the Hasmonean period. And we could talk much about that, but... Uh, so much for that for here. So we have this interesting verse in Matthew 24, 15 that indicates this abomination of desolation. It's going to happen again. So all this is history, but it's indicative of what Jesus is pointing. He uses it as an idiom for what's coming. And so we obviously want to understand what happened to understand what's coming. Okay. Then Jesus gives them instructions. Then, there's another then, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Not the ones that are in L.A. or New York or Hollywood. No, no. Them which be in Judea, fleeing the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. If you visited there, you realize most houses are on a hillside. And the top of the house is usually the garden where they have dinner and stuff. It's, it's, the, it's the, the neat place is to be on the roof. Let him who's on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. In other words, he always says, you split and you split now. You don't even grab your coat. You get out of there. And woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Key point, Sabbath day. The Matthew account is aimed at Jews. So a Gentile doesn't worry about fleeing on a Sabbath day, a Jew would. So that's going to be more important as we go. For then, again, there's that then, shall be great tribulation. Jesus is quoting from Daniel 12. I'll show you in a minute such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Ah, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And that's incidentally a comment on technology. If those days weren't short, no flesh would be saved. You can't accomplish that with muskets and bayonets. That's a technology term which is very, very a cloud on our immediate horizon to this very day. The Great Tribulation, where do you get that term? Well, he was quoting from Daniel 12, verse 1, which reads as follows. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such was never since the nation, there was a nation even at that time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So that's the promise in Daniel. There is a time that's going to be an unprecedented time of trouble. Now, since we have the Holocaust behind us now, it's hard to imagine a time that's going to even be worse than Germany during the 30s. A time of trouble such as never since there was a nation even at that time. Wow. 
Alas, the way Jeremiah calls it, he says, Alas, for the day is great, there is none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, and he shall, but he shall be saved out of it. So it's a t that's why the time of Jacob's trouble is a Jeremiah's term for the same thing we're talking about here. But then Jesus goes on, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ who there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. We're going to see a lot of similarities with the Luke account, so let's not let that throw us. I'll come to get to that when we get in a moment. <clears throat> Jesus continues, Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Don't confuse this with the rapture. That's a whole other study, but let's go on here. Then you have this strange phrase, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. A very enigmatic allusion that many scholars have slightly different views over. And uh, I won't try to get into that here, but let's leave it where it is right now. And then Matthew, then Jesus continues in the Matthew account, immediately after the tribula tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Question, has this happened yet? Not so you'd notice. So whatever this is, it is still yet future. Fair enough. Let's go ahead here. That's immediately after the tribulation of those days. Not just tribulation, the tribulation of those days. So we have the typical diagrams that we use in some of our presentations. We have the 69 weeks. We have the interval between the 69th and 70th. The 70th week is defined by a covenant enforced by a world leader. That covenant is enforced for actually six years and 11 months. But anyway, in the middle of that week of years, the abomination of desolation steps up. It's your milestone that Jesus made so much of in, the, in this passage. He himself, Jesus labels the time after that, the last three and a half years of the seven-year period, the Great Tribulation. And that's interrupted by the second coming of Christ, the establishment of what we call the millennium, and uh, his kingdom on the earth. Wow. Okay. There are different views among different church folk. There are some that believe the rapture occurs simultaneous or just before a second coming. So that's what they call a post-rapture view. There are others that believe that it happens before the 70th week of Daniel. We, we are in that group pretty much. There are some that say they put it in the middle of the week. They call them mid-tribulation, which is sort of a misnomer because the tribulation is really high. What they really mean is they see the, the rapture occurring prior to or approximate at the middle of the week. The trouble with these last, with the mid-trib and the post-trib thing is they deny a doctrine of eminence. The idea that Jesus can, can, back, can come back at any moment. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to kid his students by coming in the office and saying, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. Meaning that if they held mid-trib or post-trib views, um, I mean if they held those views, Jesus can't come back because there's specific things that have to happen first. And that's contrary to what the New Testament tells us. Because we should expect him at any moment. Now that's talking about the rapture, not the second coming, but okay. So we're pre-trib here. Whether you are or not, it's up to you. You make your own study, but we'll tell you why we have this view anytime you want to get into it. But clearly, we're in this interval. During this interval, Jesus is crucified, the temple is destroyed, and we know it lasts at least 38 years. We'll see that expressed in the Luke account, but it obviously has been longer than that. It's been almost 2,000 years. Okay. So remember that the pre-trib view has the rapture occurring some interval prior to the beginning of the seventh week. It might be an hour. It might be 30 years. We don't know because there's some preconditions after the rapture but before the seventh week can start. But we'll move on here. Continuing the Matthew account, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from the one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Many people try to make the fig tree Israel. And there's some sense in the, there are occasions when that is appropriate. But some people may be making too much of that. We'll come to that back in, that in a minute. But when the fig tree puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. For verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And we'll get back at that generation thing later. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Very important verse. Many people set dates. They think this or that. Is that one? Now the second coming, we know when that's going to be because we know the preceding conditions that lead up to it. But of that day and hour, hours knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This is one place where the Mark account throws in a little uh, boomerang in here. Because in the Mark account, Peter's account, it's recorded slightly differently. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Now this verse catches our theologians' attention because apparently, at least at that moment, there was something the Father knew the Son didn't. And that punctures some of the, some of the glib uh, uh, cliches that we sometimes bandied about. I don't think it's too material except just to improve our understanding, but the main point is we think that if, if you look at the first sentence of the book of Revelation, you realize that's the Father's disclosure to Jesus that he then and signified it to his servant John and so forth. So there is at least a time when he, he comes into his full knowledge. Some people feel that happened at his baptism, but this, hap this remark was after his baptism. Uh, and yet it's prior to the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, unto whom? Jesus Christ. First sentence, very important in the book of Revelation. But let's move on. Neither the Son. Interesting phrase. But anyway, Jesus continues in Matthew 24 at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that there were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's obviously some similarities between the days of Noah and the days when Jesus comes back. How far you apply this is a point of scholastic debate. It could simply mean that business as usual until he returns. Fair enough. Many scholars think there's more here than meets the eye. They feel you can't really understand this unless you understand Genesis 6 and the conditions that led up to the flood of Noah. Because the, uh, as the days of Noah were, what were the days of Noah like? And they were very, very strange. And there's some strangeness there you may want to get into. We won't take the time here to get into it. Let's just be aware of it, though. But he, he continues, Then shall be two in the field. One shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken. That's, that happened early in the morning. See, one field is the middle of the day. Two, two women grind, grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, the other left. That's a breakfast thing, a pre-breakfast thing. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. And, uh, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Don't be thrown by this verse because of the term good man. We misunderstand that. That's simply the, a term for the owner, if you will. Or the good man is, it means the master or the head of the house. And what he's really talking about here, who is the head, who is the God of this world? Satan. So strangely enough, that's the point. Of, that's why I personally hold the view, the reason that the rapture of the church is indeterminate from our point of view is the whole idea is to catch Satan by surprise. Because when the rapture happens, he knows that he has a small window of opportunity. And so uh, that may not, that, this is misleading if you take the good man as being a good man. No, as the term means the master of the house, really. He would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler of his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So this is one of those verses that instructs us to occupy till he comes. Yes, we study prophecy. Yes, we look we, with ex excitement, expectation. But meanwhile, we keep busy doing his work, and that's the call, obviously. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, this is one of the uses of that phrase, 
it doesn't necessarily mean going to hell. It's a, it's a Hebrew, Hebrew term of extreme disappointment. And it isn't just used uh, uh, here. It's pretty, pretty serious stuff, but it's used wherever there's major disappointment. I want to indulge in a concept here called, not from optics, called resolving power. If you get a cheap telescope and go out at night and look at a star, you see a bright spot. Big deal. You'll go back to the store and spend a lot of money and get a really good telescope and look at that same star. You discover something amazing. You discover that what single star is actually a double star. There are properties of really good optics that are called resolving power. They can discern the distinction they can d d uh, between two things that are very close together. There are many stars that are dual stars, and this is one way you want a good telescope will discern that. The concept of resolving power in optics is a concept you can apply to language. Often there are words or expressions that are almost synonymous. Be careful with that word almost. Because we have two accounts here. The Olivet Discourse package and the Luke 21 package. And I'm going to suggest to you that they are not identical. They share some phrases that are identical. Especially what we're going to just lump and call the beginning of sorrows. But the Luke account talks about things before, though. It mentions those, but before that it talks about some things. Matthew uses that term and then talks about... So Luke is focusing before the beginning of sorrows. Matthew, what follows. And it turns out there are two destructions of Jerusalem. Dest destruction number one is the one that occurred in 70 AD. Destruction number two is the one that's going to be the subject of the Battle of Armageddon, if you will. So we're going to look at now, at this point, we want to look at, now we're prepared to take a look at Luke 21, having refreshed ourselves a bit on Matthew 24. Luke 20, 21, starting about picking up about verse, verse 5. <clears throat> and as some speak of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what, shall, what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? Fair question. Very similar, not exactly, but very similar to the Matthew thing. Okay. See, even God's people will be in danger of being deceived, is the point. For centuries, Satan has led people astray and blinding their hearts. Perhaps his greatest coup is to convince people he doesn't exist. If you don't think Satan exists, try opposing sometime. And obviously that's a subject of studies you can take on on your own. And out of all of this, there have been date setters all through history that have their reasons for setting dates, even though Jesus says, don't, for such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Nobody knows the time of his return. We know there's some preceding events that, pre, that precede his setting up his kingdom. So that's easier. But the rapture could happen at any moment. It could happen before we finish this discussion. He says, be not deceived, but I'm going to seek balance and obedience. And 2 Peter 3 hammers away on that, if you want to get into that. Continuing verse 8. Jesus said, take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. Notice that that's in a command, not a suggestion. Be not deceived. And, uh, and when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Does that sound familiar? Notice that these are not signs. There are cluster of events that are going to occur, but they're not signs. Then he said to them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now again, this is the same list that we saw before. The false Christ, the wars, the famines, the pestilence, earthquakes. They're listed in Matthew, listed here in Luke, and, and there are going to be some more coming. And the uh, book of Revelation, for 12 verses. And uh, it continues, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. Before all these. Notice this, very important phrase. Luke lists the beginning of sorrows idioms, but then what he talks about happens before those signs. Okay? We've already seen some of those signs, but he's talking about something that for us is history. Before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, 
which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist, and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and by brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which be in, are in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For the, these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. This obviously is very parallel, it would seem, to the Matthew account. Except we're going to quickly discover that this refers to events that are right on their horizon. Okay? In fact, he's telling them that they, this will happen within their lifetime. Not hundreds of years later. Now you need a little history here. Vespasian was commanded by Nero to attack Jerusalem. He and his son Titus were to, they, they had succeeded in dealing with the, the um, cities north of Judea in, in, uh, in, the, in the region we call Israel. Vespasian and his son Titus attacked the cities in the Galilee and so forth. But then a strange thing happens that people overlook. Nero dies. It was under Nero's orders they were doing that, but Nero's died. When he dies, his orders expire, so to speak. There was a struggle for power in Rome. A couple of guys tried to take over and didn't pull it off. Galba and Ortho and Vitellius, they vie for the throne, they murder each other and whatever. Vespasian figures it's his opportunity to play his trump card. So he leaves and goes to Rome and takes over the empire. He becomes the, he becomes the Caesar, if you will. And when he does that then, he tells his son Titus to go ahead and finish the job. Okay? To complete the siege. This is all in Josephus in volume 6 of the Wars of the Jews and so forth. Now, I want you to get the picture. Their soldiers were encamped around there. They weren't set up with a siege yet till, till, for about six months while all this is going on in Rome. When it gets resolved, Titus is to go forward and he sets up the siege. Jesus had warned his believers, when you see the army out there, get out of town and don't let your friends come back, right? Okay, we know from Eusebius, one of the church fathers, his records in book three, that the Christians escaped to the mountains in Pella, which was in Perea, and Perea was under Syrian administration under a different situation. And uh, I've always wondered, uh, Eusebius said that not one Christian died during the, there was over a million people that were killed during the siege, Titus' the siege of Jerusalem, when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. I kept running in and said, well, no Christians died. How do you know? Well, because Eusebius records that the Christians, because of what Jesus told them to do, got out of town before. And they, didn't, they survived it. So. But then Jesus continues, Woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And indeed they were. That's what, that was the diaspora. And to this day, really, times of the Gentiles. Don't confuse that phrase used here with the phrase fullness of the Gentiles that Paul uses of the church in Romans 11.25. Times of the Gentiles actually begin with Gentile dominion all the way to the Antichrist. The fullness of the Gentiles is the term of the church. It ends with the rapture. Moving on here. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And they, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's not the harp also, that's the coming in power. When you get to verse 26, we always used to hold our breath when Walter Martin was, whenever he ran with his verse, he would always gesture. It says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And he'd always gesture like a flying saucer. He was convinced that this was UFOs. He was really on that kick. We tried to keep away from that so he wouldn't discredit this ministry for a lot of reasons. But anyway... In fact, Chuck Smith kidded Mark Eastman and I when we did our book for Alien Encounters. He says, you always tell people not to get into this because it will discredit their ministry. And we explained to, to Chuck the same way I explained to Walter. They have ministries we don't want to discredit. Mark Eastman and I, we have nothing to lose, so to speak. And we were all just kidding about it, but still. Anyway, 
Moving on here. And then shall see, they shall see the, sign, the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. And he spake unto them a parable. And again, the fig tree comes up here, but notice Luke's account. He spake unto them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees. It's because of this account by Luke I think the point that's of this parable is simply that it's spring, not a specific uh, uh, a development of the fig tree as Israel or something. Speaking to them, parable, behold a fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The parable to me is straightforward and simple. I don't think it needs to be uh, you know, pushed further than that. And all the trees. He says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. In this case here, he's talking to people in the temple, and he's telling them when you see the armies get out of town, because he says that they do. There is a prophecy that most people miss, where Jesus predicts this, and it happens 38 years from the time he said this, J Jerusalem falls. The same generation period, 38 years, that is in Deuteronomy 2 is the period of the wanderings in Numbers. 40 years in round terms, 38 years precisely. But Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and with drunkenness or cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. In other words, it can come at any moment. So he's talking about the rapture there, of course. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch out for that one. The book of Revelation has two groups of people, the believers and, those that and the earth dwellers. Those that dwell on the earth. The term is used there for those that are dwelling on the earth in contrast to being obedient to God. So as, as a snare it shall come upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Don't be an earth dweller. We're just pilgrims passing through. Jesus continued, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Boy, as a general instruction, this tells me a lot. This tells me the church is not scheduled to go through the tribulation. Because apparently you can watch and pray that ye will be counted worthy to what? To escape these things. To be caught up before the big stuff. All right. So let's move on here. Beginning of sorrows. We've been through these now. Those... After this, all, both Matthew and Luke also talk about cosmic upheaval. That's not part of the beginning of sorrows. It's at the end of their discard. Don't make the mistake of lumping that in there. I'll show you why. Because in Luke account situation, it says, The great earthquake shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilence, fearful sights. But, bef but before all these, see, there's that pr phrase again. This is the, I want to highlight the fact that verse 12 of Luke 21 tells you that what Luke is focusing on is that which occurs before all this. Okay. So there's a different difference. Luke says before all these things, all these are beginning of sorrows. Matthew says then, after those. So there's a fundamental dichotomy here between the Luke and Matthew account. And so the false Christ wars, famines over are the beginning of sorrows. Okay. So again, there's this resolving power. We have Luke 21, 24. Beginning of sorrows is the common part here. Before these, after these. Desolation, of, first desolation of Jerusalem back in 70 AD, the desolation that's yet coming. The, when the, this generation will not pass away is talking to the generation that is dealing with the first fall. He's going to use that same phrase in Matthew, but I'm going to suggest he's referring to those that are in the end times. And there's an issue there we'll come to. Here's a diagram that I hope really unlocks the whole program for you. Let's assume there's Matthew 24 and there's Luke. And we're going from smallest verses to larger to the right. Both of these accounts deal with wars, famines, earthquakes, the beginning of sorrows. Both of these accounts make reference to these wild cosmic upheavals at the end. Okay, no problem. Matthew, when he talks about the beginning of sorrows... Then, and I was after that, we have the abomination of desolation, right? And we have the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and so forth, and so on. No problem there. Luke, though, when he gets to the wars, famines, he says, before these things, and he talks about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I'm going to call that desolation number one. Matthew doesn't even touch on it. 
Matthew doesn't even touch on it. He talks about desolation, what I'm calling desolation number two, that final desolation of Jerusalem with the great tribulation and all of that. Now, when, when uh, um, Jesus says to, uh, to uh, Luke 21, he says, this generation will pass, that's the generation right then. Matthew use, he uses that phrase referring to those that are seeing those signs of the abomination of desolation following. Something very interesting in the Luke account, oh, one other thing, we have the seven letters to seven churches. Where do they fit in? Well, they obviously fit in prior to Revelation chapter 6, therefore prior to the wars, famines, and so forth. Okay? So we're together there, I think, I hope, right? Now, if you look at the seven letters, seven churches, they have a number of applications, not the least of which, though, is a historical history of the church. From the apostolic church, the persecuted church, the church that's married to the world, the medieval church, the denominational church, the missionary church, and the apostate church, which both are char characteristics of all churches throughout history, but they also dominate certain periods of church history. Now, we know that the first group, the promises of the overcomer, are postscripted, strangely enough. The last four, the promises of the overcomer, are in the body of the letter. So we that for some reason there's a structural difference between these two, and we discover upon inspection that this last four have an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ, buried in the letter. Explicit reference to second coming. Now, we know that one of them, Thyatira, is promised that if they don't turn around, they're going to go into the Great Tribulation. Wow, that's pretty hairy. There's one that's promised it won't even see the time of the Great Tribulation. So we see that distinction very early. A couple of others are a little problematical, and we can guess about that. So that's one profile here. But the point is, that's the seven letters, seven churches. There's something interesting that Luke's account doesn't even mention. He mentions nothing about the abomination of desolation, this final thing. He's left it to our own confusion to mix those up. No, no, he's kept it very clean, if you will. And just because he climaxes with the same cosmic upheaval, upheaval that Matthew does shouldn't confuse us. There's a clear focus of Luke on the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and his followers uh, took advantage of that and survived it. And uh, the Matthew account is a private briefing for the end times, responding to those four, di three, yeah, those four disciples. So again, Matthew, t Luke 21, before all these, they shall lay their hands and so forth. And shall turn to you for testimony. The English word martyr comes from the Greek word martus, which means to be a witness. We, the word martyr today means to be a dead witness, but okay, fine. And Peter talks about all that. Set it therefore in your hearts not to meditate bef what, before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your, all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. See, in other words, God will provide the Holy Spirit in extremis at the time when you need it. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren, kinsfolk, friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Pretty here. Matthew 10, not 24, Matthew 10, says it pretty straightforward. He says, think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace but a sword. Whew. Yes. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish, and your patience possess ye your souls. That's quite a phrase. Not a hair on you can perish apart from his sovereign will, is the whole point of that. In your patience possess ye your souls. Matthew picks up this in chapter, uh, chapter 24, verse 9. But uh, in your patience possess ye your souls. Believers show that they are members of the believing community in opposition to those who turn away from the faith during times of persecution. That's what separates the men from the boys, as we might say. And uh, the ones who are saved are those who are preserved by God's sovereign power. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And uh, that is exactly what Luke's listeners responded to. His account refers to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Titus and the Roman army in 70 AD, 38 years after Jesus' prediction, which is exactly the length of the generation, the famous generation in Deuteronomy and, and Numbers. But then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these, may be the these are be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. It's understandable why people casually reading this commingle 
this presentation with one of Matthew because many of the phrases are very parallel, obviously. And woe to them that are with child and them that give sucked in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive in all nations, and Jerusalem be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which is when the Antichrist finally takes over, or really it's when, when Christ undoes, his, undoes him. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. These are the cosmic things at the end, obviously. And upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexity in the sea and waves roaring. See, the population of earth dwellers in the book of Revelation is a term you want to be sensitive to because all through the book of Revelation, the earth dwellers do not repent or turn to God. It's astonishing. At one thing after another, there's no repentance. It just hardens them in their, in their way, of, in their rebellion, if you will. And especially in Revelation 9 and in Revelation 16, it comes to a climax. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And I won't give you the Martin gesture for that one, okay? For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And this was very much quoted in his trial in Mark 14. And it's an allusion, of course, from Daniel 7, where even in Daniel 7, the same allusion is made about the Son of Man coming in cloud with heaven and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And what an interesting time for us to, it is for us to read this, because not a day passes when the papers aren't full of these signs. They're not signs in the sense they're the non-signs. They're the things that the end is not yet. But the increase in the earthquakes and the tsunamis and these problems are escalating. So it's an indication that we're moving into towards a climax. Don't set dates. No, no, no. But look up for your redemption is sooner than when you first believed. And there are those that, re, that uh, ridicule these anticipations. And Peter answered those taunts in 2 Peter 3. In fact, he links our awareness of the second coming with believer in the creation. Many people don't realize that the creation and prophecy are really the same thing in the sense of God's intervening in the history of man. Every day that the Lord tarries, every day that goes by where the Lord hasn't come back for the church, is a day of opportunity. Because once the Lord comes back for his church, we're going to be scheduled for our confrontation with him at the Bema seat. Every day that goes by gives us another day to improve our report card before that seat. Our presence before that seat is a function of his completed work on the cross. If you're saved, you'll be before him. But you will be giving an accounting for the fruit bearing of your ministry. He spake unto them in a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. We've been through that. When, you, when they now shoot forth, see, know yourselves that the summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And again, uh, we, this is uh, 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 similar to what we saw in Luke 12 and Matthew 16. has a similar thing where he quotes red sky in the morning, sailor take warning, red sky at night, sailor's light. These are calls that, say, that hold us accountable to be sensitive to the seasons we're in. And Jesus says, here though, verily I say this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. When, Luke said, when he says it in the Luke passage, he's talking to those that are to escape the forthcoming um, desolation of Jerusalem. When that phrase is used by Jesus privately to Matthew, the context there is the end times, that final big deal. So there are three possibilities of this phrase that people point to, that Jesus is simply referring to apostles, that they will, you know, that... This generation will stop this way until, you know, until all things are fulfilled. Well, none of these signs mentioned took place before or during the subsequent period, so that view isn't correct. The Greek word translated generation can mean race and could refer to Israel in general as a race. Jesus used it that way in Mark 8 and 9, and Satan continues to attempt to destroy the nation, but will not succeed, as we see in Revelation 12 and following. So some people just make it apply this approach to the use of that phrase, which I think is weak. It's really a tautology. It's saying the obvious in a sense. The biblical generation can be argued to be 40 years or say 38 precisely. But uh, timing it is a whole other thing. I've expressed the views that we have here. What's the trigger here? Some say, well, the formation of the state of Israel May 14th to 48. Uh, that's one suggestion, except that there's been more than a generation since then. The regaining of Jerusalem on June 6th. Well, the problem is they haven't regained Jerusalem. It's still a point of contention. So be careful with that one. Neither of these, by the way, have textual support. 
There is another suggestion that I think is very provocative. I think Norm Geisler was the one that first pointed out the triggering event may be the Harpazo itself. And that does seem to fit all the pieces. But moving on, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, careless life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Wow, see, the Christian won't be surprised. Paul makes this very clear in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, that the believer, we're children of the light, not, we're children of the day, not of the night. That that day should overtake us. As a, it, takes, it comes as a thief of the night to those that are in darkness, not those who are in the light. But as a snare shall come upon all them that dwell in the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Boy, that needs to be our prayer. Indeed. That needs to be our prayer indeed. And we're not looking for signs. We're listening for sounds. We're listening for the sound of the trumpet. And it's not this judgment trumpets of the book of Revelation. It's not the shofar of Israel. It's the trump of God. It only shows up two places in the Bible. Exodus 19 when the law is given and 1 Thessalonians 4 at the rapture. And it's the shout of the archangel. What will you hear? Your name. I believe you'll hear your name just as Lazarus did. And uh, anyway, we'll move on here. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And uh, there's a final couple of verses to show you that I'm not off in Never Never Land here. As we see the chapter close, there's a detail mentioned that I'm surprised isn't put earlier. I was almost tempted to make the opening phrase to the study of Luke 21. And in the daytime, not the nighttime on the Mount of Olives, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple. And at night he went out in a boat in the mount, which is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. So I think there's a distinct, I think this very similar passage. You know, it's interesting. Those that travel with me, we go to different audiences. They'll hear me give a talk. I may use the same verses and the same anecdotes, <laughs> sometimes the same jokes, whatever. And yet the point I may make be very different from one audience to another because it's a different audience, different emphasis, different situation. And yet there's similarities in my presentations that, that those that travel with me sometimes uh, recognize right away. Gee, he's going that way, but he's going to, He's taking a slightly different turn. I think Jesus is the same way. The talk he gave during the day to those that were going to be faced with the, the overhang of the uh, first desolation, he presented that to, to them with that emphasis. At night with the disciples, his focus was the end times, what I'll call the second desolation of Jerusalem. So we need to understand they're, they're similar, but it's, our, it's through diligence and, and careful study that we can see the distinctives, and I encourage you to do that. And Matthew spoke to the Jews of the last days. A private briefing in the Mount of Olives, clearly so designated. Luke spoke to the local believers at that time in the temple, not in the Mount of Olives. And so it says, for what it's worth. So in conclusion, some other issues. We've gotten a little bit into eschatology. I try to not get into too much of that because there's each one of these passages is loaded with insights. The abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. There's a whole study you need to do to really understand what that's all about because it's so pivotal. Jesus points to it as being pivotal. The whole career of Antiochus Epiphanes, what all that's about. Something else about Caligula and Patronus. You know, it's interesting that uh, under Calig Caligula issued a, an edict to have his image put in the Holy of Holies. Petronius, who was the general in charge at that time, this would have been... Uh, Anyway, in the first century, after, uh, before, before Bar Kokhba, right in that region. Anyway, Petronius knew that if he followed those orders, there would be a mess of another repeat of the Maccabeus, the, the uh, 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 rebellion. So he didn't carry out the orders. When Caligula found out he didn't, he ordered him killed. But Caligula dies, and the message of his death got to, the, to Israel before the order of Petronius' death, so it was null and void, fortunately. But it's interesting to see attempts to create an abomination of desolation were thwarted by God's own hand. And uh, the hiatus of the siege in 70 AD, the fact that Titus' troops were, they were held back while Vespasian does, deals with the politics in Rome, that gave the Christians an opportunity to respond to what Jesus told them to do and to get out of town and, and, under his, and so forth. And so there's other implications here. The deity of Christ hovers all over this. 
because there's, uh, it's clear that he has a grasp of all the details. In fact, he's following a script that was agreed to with the Father long before the foundation of the world. In the coming chapters, we're going to see that unfold, um, not only in Gethsemane, well, at the, at the Last Supper in Gethsemane and on the cross all the way through. Every detail is following a script that Jesus is in control of. Judas had not planned to betray him that night. He was specifically to pick a time that, would, pick a time that wouldn't um, cause an insurrection and an upset to the Romans. He had to do it at the worst possible time from his point of view, right in the middle of Passover. So the point is the deity of Christ. You're going to see that really crisply emerge in the final chapters as we go through the climax of this gospel. And so let's stand for a closing word of prayer.